Thanks for joining us for our Fall Crop Outlook webinar. I'm Jim Mintert, Director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture, and joining me today on the webinar are my colleagues, Dr. Chris Hurt, Professor of Agricultural Economics here at Purdue, and Michael Langemeyer, who's a, also a Professor of Ag Economics at Purdue and Associate Director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. We're going to review the outlook and really focus on some of the new information that USDA released yesterday with updated yield information from the Crop Production Report and updated information from the World Ag Supply Demand Estimates released also by USDA yesterday afternoon. And then talk a little bit about uh, the inferences and what uh, we think the outlook is from a longer term perspective and discuss some marketing recommendations. So with that, Chris, let's kind of turn to some of the information. You know, we came into this. Uh, this summer uh, in an environment where we really thought ag was starting to turn the corner. Things were looking better, uh, especially in, in late May. We had some prospects of declining grain inventories, strong economic growth around the world. Um, you know, in the late May, the first couple days of June, we had uh, new crop bids for soybeans in the ballpark at $10 and $4 uh, plus on corn. And then all of a sudden, things changed things this summer. Changed, yeah. Things changed a lot this summer. Uh, the first thing, of course, that hit us was the tariffs. But about that same time, weather conditions improved in most of the Corn Belt, not everywhere, but certainly the majority of the Corn Belt. And it turned out we've had probably some of the best weather we could have had for corn and soybean production in, in much of the Corn Belt. And I think yesterday's report really confirmed that. Excellent weather, high yields. Yeah, absolutely. And we combined that with weakness in the export markets, especially on the soybean side. So let's take a look at yesterday's information. You've got a chart here with corn yields on it, and there's some startling information on there. There is. Uh, remarkable. 181.3 uh, bushel national yield on corn. Uh, and of the last five years, we have had records four of those five years. And uh, you go back and look at history, look at some of this goes back to 1990, this visual. Uh, look at 94 as an example. That was a record high national yield. Uh, 140 bushels, that's hard to even think about. Uh, but again, that's been several decades ago. But it was then about 10 years before we set a new yield record in the United States. So to have, in five years, to have four new records, we'll have to go back and look at the data uh, back uh, the 100 plus years of data USDA has. But that may well be a record to have four out of five years of setting new national records. And the increase also was substantial. Now the trade went into the report expecting yields to be down a little bit. And the primary argument I heard was that uh, the heat we had in the summer made the crop advance quickly and it's better to have cool nights where you get more uh, uh, deposit of uh, uh, starch in the corn and help raise those yields. Uh, that wasn't the case at all. We came out raising by almost uh, three bushels. So when you think about where the trade was expecting down a bushel versus up almost three, that's four bushels more than the trade expected. So that's a big number, a really big number. Well, it's a big number, and I guess one of the things to think about, Chris, is there's been a little bit of discussion, always a little bit of discussion about the pre-release estimates, some of the crop tour information that was out there in right. advance of this report with the expectations for lower yields. This is the second time that USDA has had done what, or done what they call the objective yield estimate, where they actually send people out into the field and objectively right. evaluate crop conditions, uh, plant populations, uh, looking at ear size, kernel counts, et cetera. So this is really a pretty definitive uh, approach to estimating yields and one that uh, historically has been, at this stage of the growing season, relatively accurate. And um, in the August report, uh, they rely more on their farm surveys than they do the objective yields. Because they're doing that around August the 1st, and they just can't get a lot of grain count on August the 1st. But as they move to September, they have a lot more reliability on their objective yields where they're actually sampling in the fields. So as we'd all expect, accuracy starts to really increase when you get to the September report, certainly versus August. Mm -hmm. And you expect that to continue as we see the October and November reports as well. Yeah. So it's not to say that we wouldn't see further revisions, but historically the September report has been a pretty darn good indicator of what actual yields are going to be. 
And not only the U.S. has a, has a record yield, I think all the way from Nebraska all the way to Ohio, uh, there was record yields for every single one of those states, including Indiana, and, and, and they were not only records, they were substantially above that, last year's numbers for several of those states. And uh, Illinois was sort of the peak in the Midwest here, 214 bushel yields, and I was with some peers um, from land-grant colleges back in August and uh, the general view was no, no Midwest state can be that far above 200. And uh, they were, I think, 206 in the August report, raised to 214. But I believe uh, Iowa was 206, Indiana 192. As you said, Michael, even yeah. Michigan, Wisconsin yeah. had record yields. Yeah. And the trade was kind of looking for Wisconsin with all the rain they had maybe to be down a little bit, uh, not the case. Yeah, not the case indeed. So the record yield number translates into not quite record crop production Yeah, and for remember corn. we had, uh, have had a lot of incentive, as Michael has talked in past years, to plant soybeans. And we went heavy in the eastern corn belt to soybeans. Mm -hmm. uh, but nationally, the corn acreage uh, was not very strong this year. So uh, record yields but we do not have record acreage, so we don't have record production. Still, 14.8 billion, around 15 billion bushels, will be our second largest crop. And when you think of crops that size, up around 15 bushels, the first thing we'd say is, oh my gosh, what will we do with it all? Well, USDA has an answer. They say we're going to eat, uh, consume more than that 14.8. So that's kind of exciting when we think about the corn outlook Yes, we have a lot of corn to deal with. We're going to have some logistics issues. We're going to see really weakness on that basis. But the demand base is really strong on corn, up over 15 billion bushels of use. So we want to start with a little good news before we get to soybeans. Yeah. And I guess the, the point there, Chris, we had saw a negative reaction immediately in the futures market yesterday yeah. on corn. That was a reaction primarily to the idea that USDA's actual yield number on the report was nearly four bushels above the pre-release expectations. That's correct. And uh, again, probably overdone on the downside. When you go back and look at the balance sheet they're using, you look at the demand base, and we have you know solid evidence of that demand base uh, this year, uh, then you begin to say, yeah, corn probably was overdone on that sell-off uh, immediately after the report. Let's take a look at the balance sheet in a little more detail because they did make some revisions, not just to the yield, but to some of the other usage categories that you've already kind of well, highlighted That's right. A we'll start with the 17-18 crop. So that's a year ago, the 17 crop we marketed through August of 2018. And the one revision they made was to increase the exports by 25 million bushels. And of course, that is really important. We're pushing up to near record high exports on corn, uh, 2.425 billion bushels of corn. That brought that carry out down just a little bit on the 17-18 crop uh, to right around 2 billion uh, bushels of carry out with a 340 price very similar to what we saw with the 16 crop. Now I'll get to the new crop. And the new crop, uh, again, that production of 14.8 billion bushels uh, but then look at the usage categories. Feed and residual increased 50 million bushels. The uh, ethanol increased 25 million bushels and exports increased 50 million bushels. So all good indicators that we have a big crop, maybe somewhat lower prices than was expected going into the report. So we'll increase usage more but let's get down to the bottom, not quite the bottom line, but the total usage on corn, then over 15 billion bushels. I believe for the first time ever that we would have seen usage on corn at 15 billion bushels. Uh, 10 years ago, we were at uh, close to 10 billion bushels was our usage base. So that's pretty remarkable in 10 years that we could increase by 50% uh, our usage base. Now again, going back 10, 11, 12 years ago, a big part of that was the ethanol. But still, we have done that, and it's a remarkable performance in terms of yields this year. Let's go really to what the bottom line is. That's the ending stocks. 
and USDA has added about 1.8 billion bushels. That's down from what we saw, the 17 crop at 2 billion. So they put a price uh, estimate at 350 for a season, season's average U.S. price. Pretty big range from three to four dollars a bushel on their range, but that 350 uh, with a carry out, with, with the strong use, with some opportunities probably to enhance that use uh, somewhat, uh, they're about two percent higher on feed use. We we clearly could do a little bit better than that, uh, although that's probably a reasonable estimate at this point. Um, the ethanol market has grown a little bit more than they're showing on an annual basis. They're showing a 50 million bushel increase. It's been growing at a more uh, higher pace than that. In exports, we probably will have record exports uh, this year. That 2.4 billion, I would guess, would get revised higher. Uh, we're, we have a big crop. Uh, we're seeing South America shift heavily, more heavily to soybeans. That probably means somewhat less corn coming out of South America. And so we're going to have a really good export season, it looks like, on corn this year. So I would think that price uh, could be another dime higher than that, 360 a bushel. Uh, and I, th I think we've got a really sound foundation at this point to talk about you know, strong possibility uh, that we've made our lows uh, and, and retested those yesterday uh, on futures markets. Now logistics at harvest could really gum things up where we, we would have to make another shot lower. But my guess is these are, these are near the lows that we'll see on futures markets. Yeah, we'll talk more about the storage situation and the harvest situation here in a few minutes, but that's going to put some pressure on cash prices, but maybe not as much pressure on futures prices. Let's take a look in graphical form some of the information you were just highlighting. And as you look at the ending stocks to use, which is a good way of measuring mm -hmm. uh, how tight supplies are over time when you reflect the, on the fact that the crop size has gotten so much bigger over time. A good way to scale that is to look at it relative to total usage. You look at that blue line for corn and that really highlights what you were talking about. A couple years ago we had that ending stocks to use up around 13 and a half percent. Now we're down below 12 percent. That's right and uh, again it's uh, sometimes not the first year you reduce stocks but when you start to see a pattern of reducing stocks and that's what we have in corn we are cleaning up the world surplus on corn and in terms of the world carryouts we're actually going to be tight on world inventories on corn or at least compared to history but here in the United States these numbers again are indicating uh, that that we're not back to the tightness that we had in 2010, 11, and 12, uh, but we are certainly not in a surplus, horrible surplus situation. So I think, again, all this gives us the foundation, the supply and demand fundamentals telling us corn is in, in reasonably good shape and for some price recovery. But there's more on that chart than corn. There is. And so uh, we're going to talk in more detail about the soybeans, but that's obviously the big negative, right? That's right. And we'll uh, kind of uh, talk a little more about corn, but you look at the red line. The red line is soybeans. And again, we have this record crop and not just a record crop. It's a huge record crop. We had heavy uh, soybean acreage this year and then these tremendous yields. Uh, and a, a bad year to have a huge crop when we're limited on our ability to sell that with the tariffs that we have, particularly with China. So you can see that nearly 20% stock, ending stocks as a percent of use uh, is the highest other than 06, 2006 on this chart. But to see a higher number, you have to go back to 1986. And I was telling Michael, that's when corn was below, our soybeans were below $5. Now we're not talking anything like that this year, but this is a major problem uh, and we're gonna have to talk some more about that. But uh, corn, a uh, little friendlier, soybeans, we got problems. Yeah, I mean, it's it kind of puts things in perspective when you see that stocks to use ratio in one year's time. Go up more, so much. Good point. More, more than doubling, yeah. right? Yeah. More than double. That's a good point. I mean, if you look at his, history, we haven't seen that take place in, in prior years. So that's a dramatic change. Um, 
Let's talk about storage, because you kind of implied there might be some opportunities <coughs> for storage returns on corn and actually soybeans as well. Let's look at the corn side. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the marketing uh, name of the game this year, and that is trying to earn as much return from storage as we can. Uh, that we have depressed prices uh, here in the fall time and to try to avoid selling around these depressed prices. So let me explain just a little bit of what we're looking at on these two lines. We'll start with the blue line. And the blue line, if you can see the scale, the horizontal scale, those are uh, just the starting uh, letter for the months, October, November, December, January, February, etc. We're looking at in the blue line on-farm storage returns above interest cost. So we go back at harvest time, we look at the bids at harvest time, we look at the bids for each month going out through the marketing year that we have represented here. Uh, then we subtract on-farm uh, storage interest cost only. And what we see is that when we get out to late spring, early summer, the May-June time period, returns above interest cost for on-farm storage of about 50 cents a bushel. Now that uh, doesn't have any bin cost or any uh, utility cost in it, but uh, this is a very strong recovery above interest cost for on-farm storage. Uh, then the red line is commercial storage. And there we've assumed that the cost of commercial storage is 18 cents a bushel flat through the end of November, and then they start charging three cents a bushel per month after that. So to store corn or soybeans, this is uh, corn represented here, but uh, to store through next May, that would be 36 cents a bushel, 18 cents flat, then starting in December, three cents a month for six months, uh, December through May, and that's 36 cents a bushel. So even there, we have enough uh, price bid premium out into the spring to give us 10 to 15 cents, uh, 14 is the high there, but 10 to 15 cents of recovery above our commercial storage cost. That includes interest plus these commercial storage costs. So um, that's very unusual at harvest time to see the market bidding enough in the spring and summer to pay for commercial storage, but that's what we have this year. Now in the yellow box, we've just highlighted last night's bids. Remember, basis bids will be different at various locations and could be somewhat, uh, not just somewhat, but quite a bit different than this, depending on your location. Uh, these are not ethanol plant bids, but they're not the lowest country elevator bids, so I was trying to reflect more averages. We had uh, futures, December futures, 353 a bushel at the close after the report. Uh, with a basis, I'm assuming, 35 under, that's a cash bid. Yesterday afternoon, about 318 a bushel. Moving out to the summer, July futures were 380. Basis bids were uh, 05 under to option price, and that gets us up around 380, 385 a bushel. Now, so that kind of shows us where do those premiums come from. Last night, 27 cents of that premium was coming out of the futures. That's the December to the July premium. But a lot of that basis improvement potential, 35 cents, there's your 62 cents of gross return. And then on these lines, we subtract uh, some costs for interest on farm and total cost interest plus the commercial charges on the red line. Now, those are, those are strong indications that the market is saying to us that harvest time is the worst time to be pricing. And again, we have all the logistics issues this year. We have already kind of a depressed uh, psychology in the marketplace uh, and, and uh, bids better later on. Now, on a, in addition to these returns, there's the chance for speculative returns from storage. Now, we should say when you speculate, when you put grain in the bin, commercially or on farm, and you hope prices go up, there's a possibility that they won't go up, that they'll go down. So that's the word speculation. 
but I think there's a lot of people that perceive these are low prices. We can get maybe, I'm saying a 25 to as much as 75 cent recovery, depending on what happens this year uh, for potential speculative returns above these returns above storage cost. Buy time, buy time, buy time is what we're talking about. Uh, try to avoid pricing at harvest. Buy time until you can get a better opportunity later on. Probably could be the winter, but into the spring or next summer. And Chris, the, the idea behind the speculative returns, or at least the potential for them, was really on that last chart, right? I mean, if you look at that tightening. On corn, especially. If you look at that tightening of that supply use ratio over time, that's what's given us that underlying optimism that we could see some improvement, not only in the basis, but also in the futures price. That's right. I think that's the fundamental uh, thought. And we uh, always hope prices go up, but I think there's some fundamental reasons to say the odds are higher this year, they will go up. Yeah. All right, let's turn our attention and look at uh, the soybean side a little bit uh, more carefully. Um, gee, bean, bean yields what, up as well. What right? can you say? Uh, 52.8 bushels, same pattern as we have on corn. Four of the last five years, new U.S. records on soybean yields. Um, and this yield estimate, 52.8, that was 1.2 bushels per acre higher than the August estimate. Now the 52.8 uh, was a little higher. The trade was expecting higher yields, 52.5 uh, bushels per acre. So a little bit higher, but not very much higher. We had some increases in the uses of soybeans. So when you say uh, in contrast to corn, basically the USDA yield estimate met the thoughts before going in uh, and they increased usage a little bit. So not a lot of change in terms of the overall fundamentals uh, on uh, soybeans. If you look at the production numbers, unlike corn, Oops. because Oops. we had the record <laughs> acreage, we did get the bump on total That's production. That's right. And again, we can go back and think pre-tariff, uh, most of the indicators as we ran through budgets was saying soybeans in 2018. And I remember during the winter saying that uh, many times at meetings, talking about there's a key word you want to catch this year before you go to the fields to plant, soybeans. <laughs> and of course that's kind of come back to haunt us in the sense that something came along that has not uh, Provide, provided the opportunities we thought were going to be there for soybeans. That's the tariffs. Yeah. Huge record production. Uh, again, you can see the four, four, four threes, biggest crop ever previously, and now uh, we're, we're going, uh, and I'm looking at the last five years, so four of the last five years we've had record production as well. Big, big crop. And a bad time to have a big crop when we're limited on our sailing, sa sales opportunities. And again, a little bit like corn, but maybe even more extreme, is the dramatic change in total production numbers on that chart in a short span of time. We don't have to go back very far, and mm -hmm. we were looking at soybean production of 3.1, 3.3, maybe 3.5 billion bushels, and all of a sudden we're up here at 4.7. That's a big change That's in a, a big, short span of and, time. And let's remind people why we've been expanding production so much. The continued annual growth in purchases from China. Mm -hmm. And that now becomes a problem. That's the issue going forward. Let's take a closer look at the soybean balance sheet. And you've mentioned some of these numbers, but let's walk through the, yeah, the details. Yeah, let's we'll start here. with 1718. Uh, that's last year's crop. We finished marketing at the end of August, uh, just a week or so ago. And there's the two increases that you see. Crush was increased 15 million bushels, and exports were increased 20 million bushels. So while the production numbers and the yield were a little higher than expected, uh, usage increased as well, and that helped bring those carryovers down 35 million bushels to 395 million. So that enhancement of use basically for the market offset the higher yields, and so we didn't get a lot of change. Uh, it traded a little higher on soybeans after the report. Let's go over to the year we're uh, in now with the huge crop that we're talking about. 
Uh, you can see almost 4.7 billion bushels of production. That was uh, 107 million bushels higher than the August estimate. Uh, puts us up over 5 billion bushels of available supplies. And um, the only thing they changed was the crush. They increased that by 10 million bushels uh, to uh, 2.07 billion bushels. Let's go to the bottom line here. Well, before we go to the bottom line, let's look at exports. So exports uh, down from last year. Again, this is the concern uh, over the tariffs with China. And we have to say the export number is a fluid number. It's really, we don't have uh, a sound base for, for operating in a world with 25% uh, tariffs in China. We obviously will sell more beans to Europe. Uh, we'll sell more beans into uh, countries in Africa. We'll sell more beans to non-Chinese Asian countries. Well, is that going to be enough to compensate for the loss in China? The thought is no, not enough. But um, so, so the, the base, you know, the tariffs really do change the dynamics of the trade flows on soybeans. So that's the number we're going to be watching uh, weekly on weekly export sales and shipments. USDA will be probably watching that very closely every month. We'll look at what USDA comes up with because that's still a really big critical number to us. You can go back to the uh, 2016 crop. You see uh, closer to 2.2 billion bushels of exports. You know, could we get back to a number like that? it would seem we'd have to do something to settle our trade disputes with China and probably couldn't get back to that uh, even if we could settle those for this marketing year. Bottom line, uh, never saw a number like ending stocks of 845 million bushels of soybeans. That was 60 million bushels higher than in August and USDA dropped their price to 860. Now that 860 I would think would carry, uh, if, if that is an accurate number, we should see November futures trading maybe 30 cents higher than that, around 890. They were 840 yesterday, so this suggests to me that we're about, the bean market is about 50 cents a bushel lower than what USDA's number has right here. Now is that to say USDA is right and we're going to see the futures market come up 50 cents? Or is the futures market right and we're going to see prices, the USDA estimate over time, come down? Or meet in the middle? We don't know the answer to that. But I think there is a conflict in those numbers. These numbers are probably overpricing soybeans from USDA's estimates at this point. Yeah, and a lot of that controversy probably relates, as you indicated, to the uncertainty about exports. I think that's the big part of it. Our crush is pretty stable. From year to year, that's mostly domestic use of soybean oil and soybean meal. Uh, our exports are, we don't export a lot to China in terms of meal and oil. So that means the rest of the world we export meal and oil to is pretty much like past. So the big question mark is tariffs and it relates to exports. Now, the a lot of people, I think, in the trade, and especially farmers maybe, are optimistic with respect to the idea that maybe we will get this trade dispute with China settled and we could see those exports pick up and prices rebound. This next chart, I think, is pretty mm -hmm. interesting with addressing that, that idea. So you've got soybean exports to China on a monthly basis for the last two marketing years, and the left-hand side of that chart really tells an interesting story. And the horizontal chart is the marketing year, SEP, OCT, NOV, DEES, JAN, February, etc. And China um, is very strategic in buying beans. They recognize there are two major production areas, North America, the United States, and South America in the Southern Hemisphere. So they buy beans when they perceive they're going to be the lowest price. That's at har U.S. harvest price. And then uh, in the, after February, they start buying beans from South America. Just how dramatic is that seasonal tendency? Look in October, November, you'll see the red line, that was the 16 crop, 
we were selling uh, to, and these would actually be exports or shipments to China, 300 million bushels of soybeans a month in October and November. Now, 300 million bushels of beans is about the total production of Indiana. The total annual production of Indiana is the amount the U.S. is selling to China per month. So in it, it is in, in that peak time period at harvest time. At harvest time. This is when China buys the beans. Now, if you add December to that, Ocknove and Dees, that's 800 million bushels in Ocknove Dees in 16. Um, and then pretty good numbers in January and really fading in February. So by the time we get to February, the first half of the marketing year is September to February. We sell about 92% of all the beans we sell to China, and I should say ship to China, in those the first half of the marketing year. They buy around harvest time and right after harvest time. So if we settled tomorrow, if we settled tomorrow, the difference, trade differences with China, we've already missed probably a substantial portion of uh, getting the vessels scheduled in to load these beans that are expected to be in West, Co West Coast ports and in uh, New Orleans and Gulf ports uh, in the next 30 or 60 days. We've already missed that and we're certainly not going to settle tomorrow the trade disputes with China. So I think this has to figure into our anticipation how much recovery will we get in price if we could settle the differences with China and how quickly will those price recover will price recovery come yeah so your argument and I think it's a valid one Chris is that looking at the data in past couple of marketing years at least the odds of us seeing a <clears throat> rebound and recapturing a hundred percent of that Chinese market appear very, very slim at this point, even if we settle quickly. I think that's right. And, and I think we have just missed a substantial part of that market that we're not going to be able to recover this year. And if this drags on, let's say we don't settle in the very short run, if this drags on through the fall, then the impact becomes even larger and brings those export numbers, those total export numbers that we were just discussing on that balance sheet, brings those into play on the downside, right? right? That's the concern. And this really has basis implications. Um, and why don't you tell your story about the Pacific Northwest? Well, there's been some reports in the press about some elevators in uh, terminal elevators at the port uh, actually making payments to discourage shipments of soybeans to the port because they don't have any place to put them and they don't have a place to ship them. And this too. would be like Seattle, Portland mm -hmm. ports. Correct. And again, uh, ports are generally often pass through. What they're doing is taking delivery at harvest time and pretty much immediately loading those vessels. They don't, they're not big storage terminals. Correct. And uh, so what that is saying is they, they bought uh, beans back in the spring, as an example, on forward contracts. With the expectation assuming, of shipping. Yeah. Assuming they were going to move all these vessels to China. And now the vessels aren't booked for China and they don't have storage at the port, and they're paying farmers to not send the beans, or elevators, elevators right. back in the Dakotas, Minnesota, yeah. Western Iowa. So it's a really extreme Remarkable situation. Story. What does that do? It backs those beans up into the interior. Basis levels collapse in the interior as well as at the ports. I think the key word's uncertainty here, and, I th and we, didn't, we didn't focus on the wide range in the USDA report, but the, the midpoint was 860, but the range was 735 to 985. And, and I, I could see the, the, the low end and the high end playing out depending on what happens here. And that's, that's a season average price in the low sevens yes. to near 10 as a possibility. And I think the three of us are probably arguing, we don't think the high end of that range is very likely. We think that's pretty unlikely. And this chart really tells the story, right? If we're not able to recapture a large portion of that Chinese market, it's going to be very difficult to attain the high end of that trading range. Now, China will have to buy some beans. The, you know, there's not enough uh, beans out in the world uh, outside of the United States for them to buy none. But it certainly is a major uh, relocation of the way shipping of soybeans, where they're going. Let's take a look at another chart, which is pretty instructive. This one, Chris, you put together is soybean prices at the U.S. Gulf 
minus the Brazilian port price to illustrate the discount we're looking at relative to Brazil right now. Yeah, and uh, again, the concept that U.S. beans are just worth less. Why are beans, U.S. beans worth less? It's not because the quality is poor or there's something wrong with U.S. beans. It's because the big buyer in the world, China, says that U.S. beans are going to have to pay a 25% duty. Now that's near an extra $3 a bushel just to get unloaded in ports in China. So this has tend to raise uh, the desire for China to buy Brazilian beans, which they don't have to pay the tariff on, and to discount U.S. beans or not bid as strongly. So I, uh, you can see how quickly after June 1 was the peak there, uh, and we might go back prior on the left side of that chart. These are weekly observations. The difference between the U.S. Gulf price uh, loaded on a vessel ready to go to the world market or a Brazilian port price. And uh, we traded both sides of zero, but those are relatively the same kind of a commodity until we get to early June and then you see the tariff impact really kick in. And we've run a dollar twenty-five to a dollar seventy-five a bushel discount of U.S. beans at the Gulf port relative to Brazilian beans at the port. So I think this is at least a market determined uh, loss perhaps that we might say. It's uh, not to say USDA is right when they come up with $1.65 a bushel on the market facilitation uh, payments, but uh, it could be uh, used as a justification that soybean prices have been dramatically impacted. I should say U.S. soybean prices dramatically impact by the tariffs. Now, the other part about that uh, chart, Chris, is to think about, you know, why do other countries come in and buy soybeans from the U.S.? And this chart illustrates That's that, right? Mm -hmm. So some traditional Absolutely. customers and from South, of Brazilian beans are now looking at the U.S. because of this discount. And those tariffs went into place in early July. So we really have July and August as some observations. And your point is very important, and that is uh, uh, Europe, some of the African countries, and some of the non-Chinese uh, Asian countries have been buying more. Why have they been buying more U.S. soybeans? They're cheap. They're cheap compared to Brazilian beans. So this is exactly the trade flow changes we were talking about. Now, if we go back to the Pacific Northwest that you brought up, Think how this changes the, the redistribution of the way we ship beans out of the United States. Instead of going to Portland and Seattle and then across the uh, Pacific, now we're selling more beans to Europe. And it turns out uh, Seattle and Portland are on the exact wrong side of the United States to be shipping more beans to Europe. Those are going to go out of primarily the Gulf and maybe a few more out of East Coast ports. Yeah, and so that out of position. Pacific Northwest is just out of position. And that's now. part of the imposition of cost because really what was taking place previously was the market was pursuing the least cost solution to move those beans Absolutely. around the world. We've imposed as a world trading regime uh, a new set of cost. We have to follow a new set of uh, logistics and it's not as low cost as it was before and that's really some of the net loss of, of all this and uh, if there's anything good out of this, this is good for the three of us to teach basic economic principles. It is, it is really an opportunity to see how markets work and how efficiently they, they will reorient those shipments on a global basis. But it does take time and it does create some issues. So let's take a look uh, at the what storage returns for soybeans. Yeah, because we argued corn storage returns were potentially positive. It's even stronger on the soybeans. Even side. stronger on beans. And the big reason for that is not because futures have premiums going out to July, which they do. Uh, and let's just look at those in the yellow highlighted area. So from November futures out through July futures, uh, after the close uh, post report, uh, almost 50 cent premium for July futures from harvest time. But those basis levels, uh, I put 65 under basis here. We can see lower numbers than that. Uh, in the Eastern Corn Belt, I've seen numbers 80 under at some locations, particularly river locations. Crushers tend to be about 
40 under to maybe 50 under in some cases. So the really weak basis. This is the backing up from Pacific Northwest, the, the reorientation of where we ship beans, maybe the inability to ship uh, export as many beans, and let's back up on exports on beans. We export half of our beans in this country. Exports are a big deal. Uh, you know, corn, we export 14% of our corn, so uh, exports aren't nearly as important. Beans, it's a big deal when exports are disrupted. So this is really affecting the basis, and that basis uh, will recover substantially once we get the beans tucked away, find storage for the beans. So we've got basis appreciation of 50 cents, so about a dollar premium bids, we think, for next late spring and summer versus harvest time. And again, that's waving a dollar bill on every bushel in front of a producer's face. What do I have to do to get that extra dollar? Well, you have to find storage for your beans. Right. Find a home for those beans. And, and then you've and got... And let's mention the returns. Just look at the blue line, 65, 70 cents there at the maximum for on-farm storage, taking interest cost off. Commercial storage, 30 cents recovery uh, above interest and commercial charges. Those are really substantial. Rarely do we see that on soybeans. And those are relatively low risk returns. Uh, and beyond and I, that, we the, could see some improvement in futures if we settle the tariff situation. Yeah, and I think, uh, as, as you said, corn, the fundamental reason is because we're relatively tight on stocks and usage is really looks strong. Soybeans, the reason to speculate is put our uh, hands together and say, we hope, we pray <laughs> that uh, we'll get these tariffs settled and we'll get a positive immediate reaction in the futures market. And that could be pretty substantial. I think you could immediately see a uh, 50 cent increase in beans just on settling the tariffs. Now, uh, then the reality sets in, are we going to get all that business back immediately? Probably not. It's going to take time to get that business back. So uh, I've got those speculative returns could be 50 cents up to $1.25 a bushel uh, on speculative returns. And again, we're saying that's a hope. Uh, there's reason to believe if tariffs are settled. But there's an argument can be made that we're setting in, the administra uh, Trump administration is setting in for long-term continued escalation of the trade conflicts with China. So we uh, already have approved another $200 billion of U.S. tariffs against goods that China uh, sends to us. That is approved and those can be put in place anytime. And then the Trump administration has another $267 uh, uh, billion dollars of additional tariffs they're talking about. And now if you go that far, it's everything China has sold us in this last year. This is not cooling trade tensions. This is continued escalation. Now that's for negotiating purposes, obviously, but um, uh, we don't know. It could get worse before it gets better. Yeah, and I think the other thing, looking at the slide, looking at that speculation line that we've got on there of plus 50 to plus a dollar and a quarter, the, the longer this goes on, the lower the likelihood of the upper end, right? So For the 18 <coughs> crop especially, yeah. and that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. It's, it's just going to be hard. It'll probably be several months uh, just uh, getting all the um, methods for collecting the tariffs and getting all that uh, changed, I would guess. Uh, and if we settled tomorrow, it might be for uh, would be January 1 or something like that. So I, I think that's right. The consequence, uh, the unfortunate consequence is the longer it goes on, the more permanent some of these disruptions become. Right. I, th I think, Chris, it's important to reiterate here to get to that 850, 860 that we were showing right. before in that in that uh, USDA USDA uh, you know, was the information you're going to have to store. Uh, certainly, if you sell at harvest, you're not going to be anywhere near that no. 850. And I think we're going to talk about that more here in a, and, in a upcoming And for slide. returns, that is really yes. important. All right, so let's take a look at the revenue situation because uh, when we combine high yields and the subsidy payments coming out of USDA, particularly on the soybean side, uh, it's going to have an impact. 
Well, that's right, and these are the uh, some information on the market facilitation payments. Most of our producers have uh, gotten into this pretty quickly, but uh, so we'll, we'll just briefly uh, share a few thoughts on that. Soybeans is the big part of those payments, $1.65 per bushel on that payment would be on 50% of the production. Now this uh, is also regarded at 50% by USDA to be the f potentially the first half of your production, that there could be a payment on second half of production, and USDA has said they'll try to make that decision by early December, maybe the first week of December. Um, in terms about the middle there, USDA payments and millions of dollars, those were their estimates. Go to the bottom on the seven commodities, five grains and uh, two livestock, about $4.7 billion of which beans would be 3.6. That's 77% of the payments go to beans. Now in Indiana, uh, our estimates are that 92% of all the payments will go to soybeans. So uh, in the Eastern Corn Belt, it's real, these payments are really about soybeans. So let's look at those uh, on the U.S. They come out with yesterday's yield increases to $43.56 on an average acre for the U.S. On Indiana with 192 bushel yield, that comes out to $49.50. Let's round it off to $50 of payments uh, on average for Indiana soybeans. Now again, that is based on each individual's production. All they produce and can certify they produce in 2018. So it'll vary from farm to farm, but on average in Indiana, that's $50 an acre. Go to the very bottom, and that is corn. USDA said uh, one cent per bushel was the impact of the trade, uh, trade disputes on corn and will pay on uh, this first half 50%. So that's uh, the same as a half a cent on all of your production. And that comes out for the United States about 91 cents and 96 cents a an acre in Indiana. So hey, uh, hold up one digit on corn, one dollar an acre is on average what to expect kind of here Eastern Corn Belt. That's not much compared to $50 on soybeans, but it is one dollar an acre and it's a little bit and Michael, it's not going to uh, pay all the bills for fertilizer, seed and chemical this year. Nope. But it, it's a little bit and while you're filing for the beans, go ahead and file for the corn as well. You can see the wheat numbers there, about $5 an acre, Eastern Corn Belt. Uh, not much sorghum, but sorghum's a substantial payment. Uh, U.S. average is about $30, $31 an acre. The other thing we need to talk about, uh, I think, on market facilitation payments is the second uh, iteration. Uh, will there be? USDS say there may be, there may not be. They'll reevaluate a little bit later after harvest. And they've also said that uh, they reserve the right to change these payment rates that you can't assume that beans would be paid at the dollar sixty-five. that these rates could change as well as they bring more information. So we don't know if there will be or won't be, but, uh, but soybeans at this point, this is known. That's a substantial number. It really will help cash flow. And the other thing I think point you made earlier, uh, Michael, and we were discussing before the program is that unlike our county and PLC payments, these payments are going to come quickly. Yes. As soon as harvest is completed, get your paperwork yes. in and you should get a payment very quickly. You don't wait a year, which no. is what you have to do with our county and PLC payments. So yeah. as soon as you have the information collected to, to validate your yield, you can fill out the form and, and you get the payment fairly quickly. Yeah, there's a strong incentive to get that information into your local USDA FSA office. All right, Chris, so let's combine the yield effects with the subsidy payments and look at revenues. Start, uh, this is just Indiana, but all the Eastern Corn Belt states had record yields on corn and uh, most of them on soybeans. So very good yields, so this holds in the Eastern Corn Belt. Comparing last year, uh, a little closer to average yields, Indiana on corn on the left-hand side, 180 bushels using uh, USDA prices plus 15 cents for Indiana, uh, 355 in the 17 crop, 
USDA's estimate this year, 350. For US, add 15 cents to that, 365. But with 192 bushels, at $62 higher revenue based upon these price estimates and yields. We add the half a cent on every bushel of production for the market facilitation payment, the trade aid program, and that adds a dollar, $63 more return. Soybeans, interesting to look at, 54 bushels last year, uh, 20 cents here above U.S. average prices, 9.55. This year, 60 bushel record yields. Uh, USDA's 860 nationally add 20 cents for Indiana, 880 a bushel, and that's only 12. That is still 12 dollars higher than last year. But remember, those market facilitation payments of 50 around 50 dollars an acre, or 82 and a half cents on each uh, bushel of production, and that brings us up to. Look at that number, Michael, price, 962 and uh, a half. Now again, that's assuming the USDA price of 860, and I already said that number's 50 cents higher than the futures market's talking and right now. And not selling at harvest. And not selling <laughs> at harvest. That, good points, yeah. good points. And that comes out $60 better. So if we could capture these returns from storage, um, if we can get a little bit of speculative recovery, uh, and we get the market facilitation payments on beans, it's not such a bad year after all. But I think I had about three ifs in there. <laughs> and, and one of them's not an if. Market facilitation payments will be made. And the key point, I think, for our listeners and, and viewers is the idea that to capture these returns, you're going to have to have some storage. Got to have storage. Yeah, that's going to be huge this year. All right, so let's kind of wrap up with the crop marketing strategies. So I think we've made all these points pretty quickly. Avoid pricing at harvest. Futures are depressed and basis is depressed. Bids uh, generally pretty strong premiums for uh, selling out in late spring and early summer. We've talked about the opportunity for price speculation and the foundation of that. And how are we gonna cash flow? How are we gonna get through this fall and get into the winter and, and try to hold on a little bit longer? The market facilitation payments will be helpful. It's not gonna cover all the cash flow needs but again, FSA loans are available at the government borrowing rate. So you may want to, if you're going to store more heavily this year, look at those loans as a possibility. While you're getting your market facilitation payments, ask them about their loan program. It's, uh, pretty low cost money. Definitely the lowest cost money you can get. And uh, with people doing a lot of storage this year, that could be a very important could source be very of cash uh, as we move through the fall. Well, Chris, we've talked a lot about basis. And I think this it is, is a, important this year. It's important this year, and it turns out we've got a new crop basis tool uh, available on the Center for Commercial Agriculture website. And I want to just spend a, a minute or two here highlighting how that tool works. So, in, on the main menu, when you go to our site, which is purdue.edu/slash commercial ag, you see up on the bar there the crop basis tool. Click on that, and when you do, this would be the screen that you would see. Uh, so, it defaults uh, to providing basis information for Indiana. Um, Tippecanoe County, uh, which is in the west central part of Indiana, the west central crop reporting uh, region. Um, there's the crop. You can choose corn or soybeans. And then you can choose the futures contract that you mm -hmm. want to, uh, to uh, compute basis off of. In this case, we're doing it off the nearby futures. This is really the default chart. And then on the right-hand side where it says crop years, you get a chance to compare the current year's basis with um, historical averages and you get to choose the years and in this case we default to three years but you can pick any combination of years you want to look at we've got about 14 years of data available in the database so you can go back quite a ways and compute different averages compare this year to an individual year if you so choose etc and use that as a guide to what's likely to happen so we would argue that that three-year average is probably a, a pretty good forecasting tool in terms of anticipating where the basis might be at, at that point in time in the future. And then we update this every week. Uh, and so in the current crop year, we've only got one observation that Just first week started. of September. Uh, and obviously we'll be posting new information here later this week. So we'll have this week's information up. And then you'll be able to track that as you go through the course of the year. And of course, it does confirm what you've been talking about, Chris, and that is that futures, uh, or excuse me, basis is much weaker this fall. Um, than, than historically uh, we've seen it in the past. A, a more typical would be to see West Central Indiana corn basis and the 
minus 20 to approaching about minus 25 as we get into the, the peak of harvest and then see that basis start to improve. And we're starting off weaker than that. Um, I think we probably would expect to see basis continue to weaken here as we get into really the, the heavy part of harvest here at tail end of September and into October. Um, you can also look at, at soybeans, just a, a quick look at a soybean chart. Um, and you get a little bit of a difference there on soybeans as you look at that, at that left-hand side of the chart. Um, at the beginning of September, some years we see some strength in cash soybean prices because we're really looking at the tail end of the previous crop year. Uh, so you get some spillover impact. But you can look at this year way below uh, the average. Um, and again, as Chris indicated earlier, our expectation is to see some additional weakening in the short run. But longer term, opportunities to see that basis improve. So Yeah, and especially this year, they're already saying, let's just get to our new crop bid. You know, none of this premium for early ship. Yeah, that's... that's just get to your new crop bid. And that's, that's probably 20 uh, under the new crop basis, uh, around the 40 under, you can see, is the average. Yeah, as you, norm as you normally get into that late September, early October time frame. And, you know, I think we're probably going to see some additional weakening here in the next few weeks. I probably will. Yeah. So the opportunity to track basis uh, and, and look at it on an ongoing basis, we have data on the website for Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, and Ohio. Um, and the data is sorted uh, by county. Uh, actually, underneath the, the database, it's based on crop reporting districts. But you pick off the county that you live in or the county that you would be marketing to. Um, and then the, the database determines which and crop reporting tell us how to get there is. again. So just go to our site, the purdue.edu slash commercial ag, uh, get you there, and then that top menu bar, uh, click on the crop basis tool. You can also get, that, get to this from our, our risk management site, um, and this, that crop basis tool is a menu item on there as well. So either one of those sites will get you there, and then um, uh, new information updated weekly, uh, so you can pr check and see what things are doing on an ongoing basis and then use this as a forecasting tool. So encourage people to, to check that out, uh, particularly as we're thinking about storage and evaluating basis as we go through the course of this crop marketing year. So, Michael, let's take a look at the Purdue budgets a little bit. And there's been some big changes here going back the last several years. Some of the earlier uh, part of this webinar was a, was a little bit down or a little negative. depressing. <laughs> let's let's turn to some optimistic, <laughs> some optimism here, if you will. Uh, we we have seen some uh, 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 reductions in production costs. 2013 is the peak year, so that's why I, I use 2013 here. If you look at 2013 to 2019 for corn, soybeans, and wheat on high productivity soils, looking at our budgeted costs, uh, they are down uh, fourteen dollars to soybeans, up to twenty nine dollars for corn. Uh, but the break evens have come down quite a bit. Uh, particularly for corn and wheat, uh, the break-even price for corn is down 40 cents uh, from 2013. And, and as we've indicated in other webinars, uh, we're close to that $4, uh, $4 break-even, which is certainly better than what we were uh, in 2013. So that's certainly good news. Again, that's primarily due to fertilizer uh, and cash rent. Uh, soybeans are not down quite as much. Uh, Part of the problem with soybeans, of course, is, is fertilizer doesn't have as big an impact, so that decline did, didn't have as big an impact on soybeans, but also we've been fighting with, with resistant weeds uh, in soybeans. That certainly increased the pesticide cost. But every one of those crops, uh, break-evens are quite a bit lower than what they were in 2013. Uh, comparing 2018 to 2019, uh, look at, looking at a very similar cost structure. Uh, we're not expecting any major decreases in costs or major increases in costs uh, going, going into 2019 compared to 2018. I want to spend just a couple minutes looking at relative profitability between corn and soybeans. So, so that's the next two slides. Uh, certainly, uh, as we're looking at 2019, we're looking at probably a closer to 50-50 corn and soybeans. Uh, in Indiana, uh, this year we had over a million acres more of soybeans, and so uh, and and so I think we're looking more at 50/50. But we're not not to the point where we're looking at a lot of continuous corn. Certainly, the big continuous corn in, in, in uh, certain areas of Indiana, but but across the state, we're not going to see a lot of continuous corn. And I think this 
particular table shows that. Uh, if you use an 850 soybean price, uh, corn price would have to be uh, $4 or above uh, in, to encourage us to produ produce continuous corn on, on high productivity land. Now that's certainly possible uh, if you're expecting really high yields, but with trend yields, uh, you, we're not expecting that, that to happen. Uh, but let's go to the next slide. What we are expecting to see is, is, uh, is more uh, an increase of corn on some of the soybean acres that we have. Uh, and so some of those soybean acres uh, will be planted back to corn, or, or most of them will probably be planted back to corn. Uh, and this, this table does a nice job of showing that. Uh, at 850 soybean price, uh, if corn price is, is 363 or above, uh, that would encourage you to produce corn. Uh, and remember, there's more uncertainty with soybeans than there is corn. And so I've got this going down to 750. If we're looking at really weak soybean prices in the spring, then there's going to be even more incentive uh, to switch to corn. And so it, uh, if, if that happens, then I think we're over 50% corn uh, in Indiana. So, Michael, I think it's an important uh, point to start thinking about those crop plans for next year, people, uh, particularly as people are thinking about fall fertility applications. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, switching back uh, some acres into corn, uh, now's the time to be thinking about those fertility Definitely. plans. Definitely. Okay. All right. I think that kind of wraps us up for today. So um, our next webinar will be coming up in December. We'll have kind of an overview, uh, looking backward for 2018, a little bit of a review, but actually looking out into 2019. And that'll take place in December, uh, on December 19th. And if you register for the email notification at our website, uh, you'll get an email uh, reminding you of when the webinar is taking place along with the link. So in between, check our website for updated information. Uh, we should have a, a number of things this fall, and of course, uh, we'd encourage you to check out that crop basis tool, which has just now uh, gone live here in recent weeks. So with that, thanks for joining us.